The Death and Burial of Cock Robin by Author Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Perez. The Death and Burial of Cock Robin by Author Unknown. Here lies Cock Robin dead and cold. This book his end will soon unfold. Who killed Cock Robin? I said the sparrow with my bow and arrow, and I'd killed Cock Robin. This is the sparrow with his bow and arrow. Who saw him die? I said the fly with my little eye, and I saw him die. This is the fly with his little eye. Who caught his blood? I said the fish with my little dish, and I caught his blood. This is the fish that held the dish. Who'll make his shroud? I said the beetle, with my threaded needle, and I'll make his shroud. This is the beetle, with his threaded needle. Who'll dig his grave? I said the owl, with my spade and shawl, and I'll dig his grave. This is the owl, so brave, that dug Cock Robin's grave. Who'll be the parson? I said the rook, with my little book, and I'll be the parson. Here's Parson's Rook, reading his book. Who'll be the clerk? I said the lark, if tis not in the dark, and I'll be the clerk. Behold the little lark, says amen like a clerk. Who'll carry him to his grave? I said the kite, if tis not in the night, I'll carry him to his grave. Behold the noble kite, about to take his flight. Who'll carry the link? I said the linnet, will fetch it in a minute, and I'll carry the link. Here's the linnet with the light although it is not night. Who'll be chief mourner? I said the dove, for I mourn for my love, and I'll be chief mourner. Here's the pretty dove that mourns for her love. Who'll bear the pall? We say the wrens, both the cock and the hen, and we'll bear the pall. Here are the wrens so small who bore cock robin's pall. Who'll sing a psalm? I said the thrush, as he sat in the bush, and I'll sing a psalm. Here's a fine thrush singing psalms in a bush. Who told the bell? I said the bull, because I can pull, so cock robin farewell. Here is the bull, who said he could pull. All the birds in the air fell to sighing and sobbing when they heard the bell toll for poor cock robin. End of the Death and Burial of Cock Robin Recording by Perez Thumbling by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Seymour. Thumbling by Hans Christian Andersen. There once was a woman who wished for a very little child, but she did not know where she should get one. So she went to an old witch, and said, "'I do so very much wish for a little child. Can you not tell me where I can get one?' "'Oh, that's easily managed,' said the witch. "'Here is a barleycorn. It is not of the kind which grows in the country man's field, and which the chickens get to eat. Put that in a flower-pot, and you shall see what you shall see.' "'Thank you,' said the woman." And she gave the witch twelve skillings, went home, and planted the barleycorn, and immediately there grew up a great handsome flower, which looked like a tulip, but the leaves were tightly closed, as though it were still a bud. "'That is a beautiful flower,' said the woman, as she kissed its yellow and red leaves. And as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud snap, and opened. It was a real tulip, as one could now see." But in the middle of the flower there sat upon the green velvet stamens a little maiden, delicate and graceful to behold. She was scarcely half a thumb's length in height, and therefore she was called Thumbling. A neat polished walnut shell served Thumbling for a cradle. Blue violet leaves were her mattresses, with a rose leaf for a coverlet. There she slept at night, but in the daytime she played upon the table where the woman had put a plate with a wreath of flowers around it, whose stalks stood in water. On the water swam a great tulip-leaf, and on this the little maiden could sit, and roll from one side of the plate to the other, 
with two white horsehairs for oars. That looked pretty indeed. She could also sing, and indeed so delicately and sweetly that the like had never been heard. Once, as she lay at night on her pretty bed, there came an old toad creeping through the window, in which one pane was broken. The toad was very ugly, big and damp. It hopped straight down upon the table, where Thumbling lay sleeping under the rose-leaf. "'That would be a handsome wife for my son,' said the toad, and she took up the walnut-shell in which Thumbling lay asleep, and hopped with it through the window down into the garden. There ran a great broad brook, but the margin was swampy and soft, and here the toad dwelt with her son. Ugh! Oh, he was ugly, and looked as old as his mother. Croak! Croak! Rack! Heck! Hex! That was all he could say when he saw the graceful little maiden in the walnut shell. "'Don't speak so loud, or she will awake,' said the old toad. "'She might run away from us, for she is as light as a bit of swan's down. We will put her out in the brook upon one of the broad water lily-leaves. That will be just like an island for her. She is so small and light. Then she can't get away while we put the state-room under the marsh in order, where you are to live and keep house together.' Out in the brook there grew many water-lilies, with broad green leaves, which looked as if they were floating on the water. The leaf, which lay farthest out, was also the greatest of all, and to that the old toad swam out and laid the walnut-shell upon it with thumbling. The poor little unfortunate woke early in the morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry very bitterly, for there was water on every side of the great green leaf and she could not get to land at all. The old toad sat down in the marsh, decking out her room with rushes and yellow weed. It was to be made very pretty for the new daughter-in-law, when she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf on which Thumbling was. They wanted to take her pretty bed, which was to be put in the bridal chamber before she went in there herself. The old toad bowed low before her and said, "'Here is my son,' He will be your husband, and you will live splendidly together in the marsh. Croak, croak, brick, kek, kecks. That was all the sun could say. They took the delicate little bed and swam away with it, but Thumbling sat all alone upon the green leaf and wept, for she did not like to live at the nasty toads and have her ugly son for a husband. The little fishes swimming in the water below had both seen the toad, and had also heard what she said. Therefore they stretched forth their heads, for they wanted to see the little girl. So soon as they saw her, they thought her so pretty that they felt very sorry she should have to go down to the ugly toad. No, that must never be. They got together in the water around the green stalk which held the leaf upon which the little maiden stood, and with their teeth they gnawed away the stalk, and so the leaf swam down the stream, and away went Thumbling, far away, where the toad could not get at her. Thumbling sailed past many cities, and the little birds which sat in the bushes saw her and said, What a lovely little girl! The leaf swam away with them, farther and farther, so Thumbling travelled out of the country. A graceful little white butterfly always fluttered round her, and at last alighted upon the leaf. Thumbling pleased him, and she was very glad of this, for now the toad could not reach them, and it was so beautiful where she was floating along. The sun shone upon the water, and the water glistened like the most splendid gold. She took her girdle, and bound one end of it round the butterfly, fastening the other end of the ribbon to the leaf. The leaf now glided on much faster, and Thumbling too, for she stood upon the leaf. There came a big May-bug flying up, and he saw her, and immediately clasped his claws round her slender waist, and flew with her into a tree. The green leaf was swimming down the brook, and the butterfly with it, for he was fastened to the leaf, and could not get away from it. Mercy, how frightened poor little Thumbling was when the May-bug flew her up into the tree! 
but especially she was sorry for the fine white butterfly whom she had bound to the leaf, for if he could not free himself from it, he would be obliged to starve. The Maybug, however, did not trouble himself at all about this. He seated himself with her upon the biggest green leaf of the tree, gave her the sweet part of the flowers to eat, and declared that she was very pretty, though she did not in the least resemble a Maybug. Afterwards came all the other Maybugs who lived in the tree to pay a visit. They looked at Thumbling and said, Why, she has not even more than two legs! That has a wretched appearance. She has not any feelers, cried another. Her waist is quite slender. Fee! She looks like a human creature. How ugly she is, said all the lady Maybugs. And yet Thumbling was very pretty. Even the Maybug who had carried her off saw that. But when all the others declared she was ugly, he believed it at last, and would not have her at all. She might go whither she liked. Then they flew down with her from the tree, and set her upon a daisy. And she wept, because she was so ugly that the Maybugs would have nothing to say to her. And yet she was the loveliest little being one could imagine, and as tender and delicate as a rose leaf. The whole summer through poor Thumbling lived quite alone in the great wood. She wove herself a bed out of blades of grass, and hung it up under a shamrock, so that she was protected from the rain. She plucked the honey out of the flowers for food, and drank of the dew which stood every morning upon the leaves. Thus summer and autumn passed away. But now came winter, the cold, long winter. All the birds who had sung so sweetly before her flew away. Trees and flowers shed their leaves. The great shamrock under which she had lived shriveled up, and there remained nothing of it but a yellow, withered stalk. And she was dreadfully cold, for her clothes were torn, and she herself was so frail and delicate. Poor little Thumbling! She was nearly frozen. It began to snow, and every snowflake that fell upon her was like a whole shovelful thrown upon one of us, for we are tall, and she was only an inch long. Then she wrapped herself in a dry leaf, and that tore in the middle, and would not warm her, so she shivered with cold. Close to the wood into which she had now come lay a great cornfield, but the corn was gone long ago, only the naked dry stubble stood out of the frozen ground. These were just like a great forest for her to wander through, and oh, how she trembled with cold! Then she arrived at the door of the field mouse. This mouse had a little hole under the stubble. There the field mouse lived, warm and comfortable, and had a whole room full of corn, a glorious kitchen and larder. Poor Thumbling stood at the door just like a poor beggar girl, and begged for a little bit of barley corn for she had not the smallest morsel to eat for the last two days. "'You poor little creature,' said the field mouse, for after all she was a good old field mouse. "'Come into my warm room and dine with me.' As she was pleased with Thumbling, she said, "'If you like, you may stay with me through the winter, but you must keep my room neat and clean, and tell me pretty little stories, because I am very fond of hearing those.' And Thumbling did as the kind old field mouse bade her, and had a very good time of it. "'Now we shall soon have a visitor,' said the field mouse. "'My neighbor is in the habit of visiting me once a week. He is even better off than I am, has great rooms, and a beautiful black velvety fur. If you could only get him for your husband, you would be well provided for. You must tell him the prettiest stories you know.' but Thumbling did not care about this. She thought nothing of the neighbor, for he was a mole. He came and paid his visits in his black velvet coat. The field mouse told how rich and how learned he was, and how his house was more than twenty times larger than hers, that he had learning, but that he did not like the sun and beautiful flowers, for he had never seen them. Thumbling had to sing, and she sang, Ladybug, Ladybug, fly away home and when the parson goes afield. Then the mole fell in love with her, 
because of her delicious voice. But he said nothing, for he was a very sedate person. A short time before he had dug a long passage through the earth from his own house to theirs, and Thumbling and the field mouse obtained leave to walk in this passage as much as they wished. But he begged them not to be afraid of the dead bird which was lying in the passage. It was an entire bird, with wings and a beak. It certainly must have died only a short time before, and was now buried just where the mole had made his passage. The mole took a bit of decayed wood in his mouth, and it glimmered like fire in the dark, and then he went first and lighted them through the long dark passage. When they came where the dead bird lay, the mole thrust up his broad nose against the ceiling, so that a great hole was made, through which the daylight could shine down. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, his beautiful wings pressed close against his sides, and his head and feet drawn back under his feathers. The poor bird had certainly died of cold. Thumbling was very sorry for this. She was very fond of all the little birds who had sung and twittered so prettily before her through the summer. But the mole gave him a push with his crooked legs and said, Now he doesn't pipe any more. It must be miserable to be born a little bird. I'm thankful that none of my children can be that. Such a bird has nothing but his tweet wheat and has to starve in the winter. Yes, you may well say that as a clever man, observed the mouse. Of what use is all this tweet wheat to a bird when the winter comes? He must starve and freeze. But they say that's aristocratic. Thumbling said nothing, but when the two others turned their backs on the bird, she bent down, put the feathers aside which covered his head, and kissed him upon his closed eyes. Perhaps it was he who sang so prettily before me in the summer, she thought. How much pleasure he gave me, the dear, beautiful bird! The mole now closed up the hole through which the daylight shone in, and accompanied the ladies home. But at night Thumbling could not sleep at all, so she got up out of her bed, and wove a large beautiful carpet of hay, and carried it, and spread it over the dead bird, and laid the thin stamens of flowers, soft as cotton which she had found in the field mouse's room, at the bird's sides, so that he might lie soft on the ground. Farewell, you pretty little bird," said she. "Farewell, and thanks to you for your beautiful song in the summer, when all the trees were green and the sun shone down warmly upon us." And then she laid the bird's head upon her heart. But the bird was not dead; he was only lying there torpid with cold, and now he had been warmed and came to life again. In autumn. All the swallows fly away to warm countries, but if one happens to be belated, it becomes so cold that it falls down as if dead and lies where it fell, and then the cold snow covers it. Thumbling fairly trembled. She was so startled, for the bird was large, very large compared with her, who was only an inch in height. But she took courage, laid the cotton close around the poor bird, and brought a leaf that she had used as her own coverlet. And laid it over the bird's head. The next night she crept out to him again, and now he was alive, but quite weak. He could only open his eyes for a moment and look at Thumbling, who stood before him with a bit of decayed wood in her hand, for she had not a lantern. I thank you, you pretty little child," said the sick swallow. "I have been nicely warmed." Soon I shall get my strength back again, and I shall be able to fly about in the warm sunshine. Oh, she said, it is so cold without; it snows and freezes. Stay in your warm bed, and I will nurse you. Then she brought the swallow water in the petal of a flower, and the swallow drank, and told her how he had torn one of his wings in a thorn bush, and thus had not been able to fly so fast as the other swallows, which had sped away. Far away to the warm countries. So at last he had fallen to the ground, but he could remember nothing more, and did not know at all how he had come to where she had found him. The whole winter the swallow remained there, and Thumbling nursed and tended him heartily. Neither the field mouse nor the mole heard anything about it, for they did not like the poor swallow. So soon as the spring came and the sun warmed the earth. 
The swallow bade Thumbling farewell, and she opened the hole which the mole had made in the ceiling. The sun shone in upon them gloriously, and the swallow asked if Thumbling would go with him. She could sit upon his back, and they would fly away far into the green wood. But Thumbling knew that the old field mouse would be grieved if she left her. No, I cannot, said Thumbling. Farewell, farewell, you good pretty girl, said the swallow, and he flew out into the sunshine. Thumbling looked after him. And the tears came into her eyes, for she was heartily and sincerely fond of the poor swallow. Tweet, 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 said the bird, and flew into the green forest. Thumbling felt very sad. She did not get permission to go out into the warm sunshine. The corn, which was sown in the field over the house of the field mouse, grew up high into the air. It was quite a thick wood for the poor girl, who was only an inch in height. You are betrothed now, Thumbling, said the field mouse. My neighbor has proposed for you. What great fortune for a poor child like you! Now you must work at your outfit, woolen and linen clothes both, for you must lack nothing when you become the mole's wife. Thumbling had to turn the spindle, and the mole hired four spiders to weave for her day and night. Every evening the mole paid her a visit. And he was always saying that when the summer should draw to a close, the sun would not shine nearly so hot, for that now it burned the earth almost as hard as a stone. Yes, when the summer should have gone, then he would keep his wedding day with Thumbling. But she was not glad at all, for she did not like the tiresome mole. Every morning when the sun rose, and every evening when it went down, she crept out at the door. And when the wind blew the corn ears apart, so that she could see the blue sky, she thought how bright and beautiful it was out there, and wished heartily to see her dear swallow again. But the swallow did not come back; he had doubtless flown far away in the fair green forest. When autumn came on, Thumbling had all her outfit ready. In four weeks you shall celebrate your wedding," said the field mouse to her. But Thumbling wept. And declared she would not have the tiresome mole. Nonsense," said the field mouse. "Don't be obstinate, or I will bite you with my white teeth. He is a very fine man whom you will marry. The queen herself has not such a black velvet fur, and his kitchen is full. Be thankful for your good fortune." Now the wedding was to be held. The mole had already come to fetch Thumbling. She was to live with him deep under the earth and never to come out into the warm sunshine. For that he did not like. The poor little thing was very sorrowful. She was now to say farewell to the glorious sun, which, after all, she had been allowed by the field mouse to see from the threshold of the door. Farewell, thou bright sun," she said, and stretched out her arms toward it, and walked a little way forth from the house of the field mouse. For now the corn had been reaped, and only the dry stubble stood in the fields. Farewell," she repeated. Twining her arms round a little red flower which still bloomed there, greet the swallow from me if you see him again. Tweet tweet, tweet tweet. A voice sounded suddenly over her head. She looked up. It was the little swallow who was just flying by. When he saw Thumbling, he was very glad, and she told him how loath she was to have the ugly mole for her husband, and that she was to live deep under the earth where the sun never shone. And she could not refrain from weeping. The cold weather is coming now," said the swallow. "I am going to fly far away to the warm countries. Will you come with me? You can sit upon my back. Then we shall fly from the ugly mole in his dark room, away, far away, over the mountains to the warm countries, where the sun shines warmer than here, where it is always summer, and there are lovely flowers." Only fly with me, you dear little Thumbling, you who have saved my life when I lay frozen on the dark, earthy passage. Yes, I will go with you," said Thumbling, and she seated herself on the bird's back, with her feet on his outspread wing, and bound her girdle fast to one of his strongest feathers. Then the swallow flew up into the air. Over forest and over sea, high up over the great mountains where the snow always lies, and Thumbling felt cold in the bleak air, 
but then she hid under the bird's warm feathers, and only put out her little head to admire all the beauties beneath her. At last they came to the warm countries. There the sun shone far brighter than here. The sky seemed twice as high. In ditches and on the hedges grew the most beautiful blue and green grapes. Lemons and oranges hung in the woods. The air was fragrant with myrtles and balsams, and on the roads the loveliest children ran about, playing with the gay butterflies. But the swallow flew still further, and it became more and more beautiful. Under the most glorious green trees, by the blue lake, stood a palace of dazzling white marble from the olden time. Vines clustered all around the lofty pillars. At the top were many swallows' nests, and in one of these the swallow lived, who carried Thumbling. "'That is my house,' said the swallow. "'But it is not right that you should live there. It is not yet properly arranged by a great deal, and you will not be content with it. Select for yourself one of the splendid flowers which grow down yonder, then I will put you into it, and you shall have everything as nice as you can wish.' "'This is delightful,' cried she, clapping her hands. A great marble pillar lay there, which had fallen to the ground, and had been broken into three pieces. But between these pieces grew the most beautiful great white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbling, and set her upon one of the broad leaves. But what was the little maid's surprise? There sat a little man in the midst of the flower, as white and transparent as if he had been made of glass. He wore the neatest of gold crowns on his head, and the brightest wings on his shoulders. He himself was not bigger than Thumbling. He was the angel of the flower. In each of the flowers dwelt such a little man or woman, but this one was king over them all. "'Heavens! How beautiful he is!' whispered Thumbling to the swallow. The little prince was very much frightened at the swallow, for it was quite a gigantic bird to him, who was so small. But when he saw Thumbling, he became very glad. She was the prettiest maiden he had ever seen. Therefore he took off his golden crown, and put it upon her, and asked her name, and if she would be his wife, and then she should be queen of all the flowers. Now this was truly a different kind of man to the son of the toad, and the mole with the black velvet fur. She therefore said yes to the charming prince, and out of every flower came a lady or lord, so pretty to behold that it was a delight. Each one brought Thumbling a present. But the best gift was a pair of beautiful wings which had belonged to a great white fly. These were fastened to Thumbling's back, and now she could fly from flower to flower. Then there was much rejoicing, and the little swallow sat above them in his nest, and was to sing the marriage song, which he accordingly did as well as he could. But yet in his heart he was sad, for he was so fond, oh, so fond of Thumbling, and would have liked never to part from her. "'You shall not be called Thumbling,' said the flower angel to her. "'That is an ugly name, and you are too fair for it. We will call you Maya. Farewell, farewell, said the little swallow with a heavy heart, and he flew away again from the worn countries, far away back to Denmark. There he had a little nest over the window of the man who can tell fairy tales. Before him he sang, Tweet, 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 and from him we have the whole story. End of Thumbling Recording by Gail Seymour. Please visit my blog, The Voice of Gail, at gailseymour.blogspot.com. That's G A I L S E Y M O U R dot B L O G S P O T dot C O M. King Winter by Author Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Perez. King Winter by Author Unknown. The sky is dull and gray, piercing and chill the blast. Each step resounds on the frosty ground. Winter is come at last. Mama sits by the fire, her little ones round her knees. How cozy we are, Mama, they cry. Tell us something, if you please. Tell us about King Winter, and about Jack Frost, his man. We'll not be noisy or naughty at all, but as good as ever we can. Well then, says Mama, you, Jenny, may knit and listen, my dear, and Johnny may split up wood to make the fire burn bright and clear. King Winter dwells in the north, far away in the frozen zone. In a palace of snow he holds his court, and sits on an icy throne. He has cushions, of course, his queen, made them out of her wedding gown, stuffing them well with snowflakes fine, and soft as eiderdown. The king has a trusty servant. Jack Frost is his name, his nose, is raspberry red, his beard is white, and stiff as a crutch it grows. Old Jack is a sturdy good fellow, and serves their majesties well. He's here, and he's there, and he's everywhere, and does more than I can tell. Each year, as the day comes round, the king and his royal train set off on a tour through the wide, wide world and sweep over mountain and plain. His majesty fails not to visit every clime that's not too hot, to look in upon both high and low, from the palace down to the cot. Jack Frost has a busy time then, but he's helped and advised by the queen that all may be right when the king goes forth, and everything fit to be seen. That the king may have pleasant travel, and no stone hurt his royal toe, her majesty spreads all over the earth a carpet of downy snow. Fine mirrors the king delights in, none are finer than Jack can make, and in matchless sheets of crystal clear he lays them on river and lake. The trees all naked and drear he robes in the purest white, and with icicles shining with rainbow hues, he makes their branches bright. And for what of buds and blossoms to strew in his majesty's way? With magic flowers of his own device, he makes the windows gay. These wonders wrought in a single night may well excite surprise. Amazed is the sun when he gets up at dawn, and he stares with all his eyes. Then out come all the boys and girls, Jack's handiwork to view and their noses and cheeks turn red with cold, some of them even turn blue. They pelt each other with snow, roll it up in a mighty ball, and shout and laugh and scamper about, and heels over head they fall. They make a huge man of snow, as grand as a Russian czar, a wooden sword in his hand in his mouth, a carrot to serve for cigar. His eyes, his hair, and his beard, they paint as black as my shoe, with burnt stick, but they spoil his nose, for they stick it rather askew. Then what do you think for a cock shot? They take him, they pelt him, and hit. They knock of the snowman's ears and nose, but he does not mind it a bit. Hooray for the good thick ice! Oh, isn't it jolly? They slide. They skate and in sleigh, so fine they go, and swift as the wind they glide. King Winter laughs at the sport, cries bravo, and claps his hands and calling in haste for his man Jack Frost, he gives him these commands. Go see the papas and mamas, and bring me word what they say. Have the children been good and well behaved since last I came this way? The king trims Christmas trees to give to good girls and boys, with tapers and trinkets of silver and gold, and all sorts of dainties and toys. The queen cuts twigs of birch, of birch so supple and keen, and daintily ties them up into rods the finest that ever were seen. Soon with this word to the king, Jack Frost comes back at a trot. Good have most of the children been, but some of them have not. The king gives him the pretty trees, the queen the rods so smart, and away goes Jack again with his load, till every house has its part. Cakes, mince pies, nuts, and apples, good children get from the king, you can guess what the naughty get. The rods are the only thing. Oh, dear mamma, cries Jenny. Johnny's been good, and so have I. Pray tell Jack Frost we don't want the rod. Oh, do ask him to put it by. Mamma smiles on her darlings, 
they run to her, kiss her, and say, How long do you think will it be, Mama, ere King Winter goes away? He will lay upon baby's cradle the snowdrops that early come forth, and then, my dears, he will bid us good-bye and go back to his home in the north. End of King Winter Recording by Perez Best Stories to Tell to Children by Sarah Cohn Bryant The Little Hero of Harlem This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Al C. Best Stories to Tell to Children by Sarah Cohn Bryant The Little Hero of Harlem a long way off across the ocean there is a little country where the ground is lower than the level of the sea instead of higher as it is here of course the water would run in and cover the land and houses if something were not done to keep it out but something is done the people build great thick walls all around the country and the walls keep the sea out you see how much depends on those walls the good crops the houses and even the safety of the people even the small children in that country know that an accident to one of those walls is a terrible thing. These walls are really great banks, as wide as roads, and they are called dikes. Once there was a little boy who lived in that country whose name was Hans. One day he took his little brother out along by the dike to play. They went a long way out of town and came to where there were no houses, but ever so many flowers and green fields. By and by, Hans climbed up on the dike and sat down. The little brother was playing about at the foot of the bank. Suddenly the little brother called out, Oh, what a funny little hole! It bubbles! Hole? Where? said Hans. Here in the bank, said the little brother. Water's in it. What? said Hans, and he slid down as fast as he could to where his little brother was playing. There was the tiniest little hole in the bank. Just an air hole. A drop of water bubbled slowly through. "'It's a hole in the dike,' cried Hans. "'What shall we do?' He looked around. Not a person or a house in sight. He looked at the hole. The little drops oozed steadily through. He knew that the water would soon break a great gap because that tiny hole gave it a chance. The town was so far away. If they ran for help, it would be too late. What should he do? Once more he looked. The hole was larger now, and the water was trickling. Suddenly a thought came to Hans. He stuck his little forefinger right into the hole where it fitted tight, and he said to his little brother, Run, Dieting. Go to town and tell the men there's a hole in the dike. Tell them I will keep it stopped until they get here. The little brother knew by Hans's face that something very serious was the matter, and he started for the town as fast as his legs could run. Hans, kneeling with his finger in the hole, watched him grow smaller and smaller as he got farther away. Pretty soon he was as small as a chicken. Then he was only a speck. Then he was out of sight. Hans was alone, squatted on the ground with his finger tight in the bank. He could hear the water slap, slap, slap on the stones, and deep down under the slapping was a gurgling, rumbling sound. It seemed very near. By and by his hand began to feel numb. He rubbed it with the other hand, but it got colder and more numb, colder and more numb every minute. He looked to see if the men were coming. The road was bare as far as he could see. Then the cold began creeping, creeping, up his arm, first his wrist, then his arm to the elbow, then his arm to his shoulder. How cold it was! And soon it began to ache. Ugly little cramp pains streamed up his finger, up his palm, up his arm, till it ached way into his shoulder and down the back of his neck. It seemed hours since the little brother went away. He felt very lonely, and the hurt in his arm grew and grew. He watched the road with all his eyes, but no one came in sight. 
Then he leaned his head against the dike to rest his shoulder. As his ear touched the dike, he heard the voice of the great sea murmuring. The sound seemed to say, I am the great sea. No one can stand against me. What are you, a little child, that you try to keep me out? Beware! Beware! Hansa's heart beat in heavy knocks. Would they never come? He was frightened. And the water went on beating at the wall and murmuring, I will come through, I will come through, I will get you, I will get you, run, run, before I come through. Hans started to pull out his finger. He was so frightened that he felt as if he must run forever, but that minute he remembered how much depended on him. If he pulled out his finger, the water would surely make the hole bigger, and at last break down the dike, and the sea would come in on all the land and houses. He set his teeth and stuck his finger tighter than ever. "'You shall not come through,' he whispered. "'I will not run.' Just as he thought it, he heard a far-off shout. Far in the distance he saw a black something on the road and dust. The men were coming. At last they were coming. They came nearer, fast, and he could make out his own father and the neighbors. They had pickaxes and shovels, and they were running, and as they ran they shouted, We're coming! Take heart! We're coming! The next minute it seemed they were there, and when they saw Hans with his pale face and his hand tied in the dike, they gave a great cheer, just as people do for soldiers back from war. And they lifted him up and rubbed his aching arm with tender hands, and they told him that he was a real hero and that he had saved the town. When the men had mended the dike, they marched home like an army, and Hans was carried high on their shoulders because he was a hero. And to this day the people of Harlem tell the story of how a little boy saved the dike. End of Best Stories to Tell to Children by Sarah Cohn Bryant, The Little Hero of Harlem The Circus Procession by Author Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Perez. The Circus Procession by Author Unknown. Open the gates and draw the curtain. Here comes something fine that's certain. Louder the band begins to play. Open the gates and clear the way. Enters a queen with a king beside her. Every horse is proud of his rider. Two by two they march to the tune and head the procession that will follow soon. Men in livery in their places make the gay steeds keep their paces, soothing down their wildest fears at the rising shouts and cheers. Jocko in these sports a sharer acts the part of a standard bearer, while behind him soldiers gay bugle notes of victory play. Now a clown in line appearing with a tandem swells the cheering, standing on his horse's back, thus he guides them round the track on a donkey rides another quite as funny as his brother blowing bugle notes so loud he astonishes the crowd here's another clown arriving in a chariot he is driving like a noble roman dressed lo he guides three steeds abreast nimble little monkey tony rides along upon a pony followed by a stupid clown who thinks the rain is pouring down here's a creature young and slender dressed in robes of dazzling splendor in a chariot decked with gold she's the fairy queen i'm told close behind her two enormous elephants first-rate performers stalk along with heavy tread sending on their trunks ahead here is something very funny surely worth the entrance money at the sight what laughter peals tis an elephant on wheels close behind him a relation in a state of perspiration don his specs and wields his fan just like any gentleman here is jumbo gentle creature kindness shown in every feature on his back the children are safe as in a jaunting car shetland ponies small and stocky each one mounted by a jockey march twixt elephants and giraffe tis no wonder towser laughs hark the trumpet loudly pealing knocks the plaster from the ceiling as their marches on the course the jumbos of the police force clowns and dogs with queer expression have their place in this procession and tis hard for dogs i know on their two hind legs to go 
Who are these with courtly manners, bearing lofty poles and banners? Faithfully they represent followers of the tournament. Next a line of pretty pages, our attention close engages. The Chinese giant in the rear, making them like dwarfs appear. Here's a funny turnout, surely, with an ostrich last securely. To a coat Zenobia shares, and well the bird the burden bears. Goats upon the mountains ramble, and in harness sometimes amble, but a tandem team like this is a sight you should not miss. Through the deserts camels travel, speeding are the sand and gravel, bearing heavy burdens too, which in our land they could not do. Here the roads are rough and stony, and the camels back so bony, none but clowns would dare to go on them with the circus show. Goodness gracious, did you ever hear our harness up quite clever? Two giraffes, the whip they heed, nor venture at a breakneck speed. A soldier comes on stilts he's stalking, back of him a dude is walking, either side of him a friend, as you can see, and that's the end. End of the Circus Procession. Recording by Perez. Cleopatra, or the Reformed Little Tyrant, by M. Brackett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A part little hussy, whose name was Cleopatra, was continually teasing and commanding her poor brother. So you will not do what I bid you, Mr. Obstinacy, she would often say to him. Come, come, sir, obey, or it shall be worse for you. If Cleopatra's word might be taken for it, her brother did everything wrong. But on the contrary, whatever she thought of doing was the masterpiece of reason and sound sense. If he proposed any kind of diversion, she was sure to consider it as dull and insipid. But it often happened that she would herself the next day recommend the same thing, and, having forgotten what she said of it before, consider it as the most lively and entertaining. Her brother was obliged to submit to her unaccountable whims and fancies, or else endure the most disagreeable lectures a little female tongue could utter. If ever he presumed to be so hardy as to reason with her on her strange conduct, instant destruction to his playthings were the inevitable consequence of it. Her parents saw with regret this strange and tyrannical disposition of their daughter, and in vain did everything they could think of to break her of it. Her mother, in particular, continually enforced on her mind that such children never procured the esteem of others, and that a girl who set up her own opinion against that of everyone else would soon become intolerable and insupportable to all her acquaintance. This prudent advice, however, made no impression on her stubborn heart, and her brother, wearied out by her caprice and tyranny, began to have very little affection for her. It one day happened that a gentleman of a free and open temper dined at their house, he could not help observing with what a haughty air she treated her poor brother, and indeed every other person in the room. At first the rules of politeness kept him from saying anything, but at last, tired out with her impertinence, he began addressing his discourse to her mamma in the following manner. I was lately in France, and as I was fond of being present at the soldiers' exercises, I used to go as often as I could to see their maneuvers on the parade, nearly in the same manner as they do here at St. James's. Among the soldiers there were many, I observed, with whiskers, which gave them a very fierce and soldier-like look. Now. 
Had I a child like your Cleopatra, I would instantly give her a soldier's uniform and put her on a pair of whiskers, when she might, with rather more propriety than at present, act the part of a commander. Cleopatra heard this and stood covered with confusion. She could not help blushing and was unable to conceal her tears. However, this reproach perfectly reformed her, and she became sensible how unbecoming was a tyrannizing temper. It has been observed that to be sensible of our errors is half the work of reformation. So it happened with Cleopatra, who, with the assistance of her mother's prudent counsels, became an amiable girl. Her reformation was a credit to her, and it is much to be wished that all young ladies who take no pains to conquer their passions would at least imitate Cleopatra, and wish to avoid being told that a soldier's dress and a pair of whiskers would better become them than nice cambric frocks and silk slips. Had Cleopatra attended to the advice of her parents, and not have imagined that greatness consists in impertinence, she would have been happy much sooner than she was. End of Cleopatra, or The Reformed Little Tyrant The Jolly Fisherman, contributed by Boston Public Library. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taylor Arnett. The Jolly Fisherman, contributed by Boston Public Library. One wee kitten in the house it's all as quiet as a mouse when there are two it's not so quiet but not enough to call a riot when three are there they make a noise most like a schoolroom full of boys those kittens three kick up such capers papa can't read his daily papers i think the best he can do is send all three to school don't you their noise and capers will cease and he can read the news in peace at the toy shop Buy, buy, what shall we buy? A horse to ride or a kite to fly? A train, a boat, or a ball? A lady doll or a sailor boy? It's terribly hard to choose a toy when you like to try them all. The doggies promenade. Three dogs went out for a promenade all on a summer's day. There was Mr. Dog and Mrs. Dog and little doggy Trey. And as they walked down the crowded street, they were proud as proud could be. For they were dressed in their very best, as every one could see. But a mischievous cat on the sidewalk stood. No coat, no hat in his cheeks. And she laughed at the dress and the pomposeness of the dog and his family. Mr. Dog growled deep and sprang at the cat and chased her up and down with an angry cry and flashing eyes throughout the wandering town. But he tripped and fell in the slippery street. And when he arose, lo! His stylish clothes were mud from head to toe. And Mrs. Dog, when she saw his plight with horror, swooned away and sank right down with her silken gown on a heap of soft red clay. Wee Baby Dog was in sad distress. He sought for his cap in vain. His kilt was torn, he was all forlorn, and his tears fell down like rain. But the ruggish cat at her fireside sat and thought of her fun that day and she jumped and danced and purred and pranced at the doggies running away just notice our clothes as we walk in the line did you ever see anything half so fine old dog is a humbug on a fraud he is bent mr goose is a fool if he gives him a cent they didn't know it was loaded very refreshing you get the very best milk, you know, with the chalk and water dairy co. Mom and his mother, whenever they pass, always call in and have a glass. Jumbo's Garden. 
Jumbo has a garden, a pretty little garden, filled with every flower that grows, and was watered every day, in a novel sort of way, with his trunk for a garden hose. Wide awake! Oh, Biddy, said Foxy, come sit with me. The moon's wide awake. I wait for thee. No thanks, said Biddy, I'm safer here. The moon is wide awake. So am I, Foxy dear. The Family Coach This is the way the kittens play when their children are gone, gone away. Six in the coach and all alive, gone off for a lovely drive. Tumbling down, they never mind. They run in front, they run behind. Tabitha Mew has lost her head. Worse things happen at sea than that. So take my warning, girls and boys, and put away all your toys, or else the kittens with them will play whenever you happen to go away. End of The Jolly Fisherman. Recording by Taylor Arnett. The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Hirschbach. The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For his eyes he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword-hilt. He was very much admired indeed. "'He is as beautiful as a weathercock,' remarked one of the town councillors, who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic taste. Only, um, not quite so useful, he added, fearing lest people should think him unpractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked a sensible mother of her little boy, who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. I am glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. "'He looks just like, like an angel,' angel, said the charity children, as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. "'How do you know?' said the mathematical master. "'You have never seen one.' "'Ah, oh, oh, but, but we, we have, have in, in our, our dreams,' dreams, answered the children. And the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe, for he did not approve of children dreaming. One night there flew over the city a little swallow. His friends had gone away to Egypt six weeks before, but he had stayed behind, for he was in love with the most beautiful reed. He had met her early in the spring as he was flying down the river after a big yellow moth and had been so attracted by her slender waist that he had stopped to talk to her. "'Shall I love you?' said the swallow, who liked to come to the point at once. And the reed made him a low bow. So he flew round and round her, touching the water with his wings and making silver ripples. This was his courtship, and it lasted all through the summer. "'It is a attachment twittered the other swallows. She has no money, and far too many relations. And, indeed, the river was quite full of reeds. Then when autumn came, they all flew away. After they had gone, he felt lonely, and began to tire of his lady love. She has no conversation, he said, and I am afraid that she is a coquette, for she is always flirting with the wind. And certainly, whenever the wind blew, the reed made the most graceful curtsies. I admit that she is domestic, he continued, but I love traveling, and my wife, consequently, should 
love traveling also. Will you come away with me? he said finally to her. But the reed shook her head. She was so attached to her home. You have been trifling with me, he cried. I am off to the pyramids. Good-bye! And he flew away. All day long he flew, and at night-time he arrived at the city. Where shall I put up? he said. I hope the town has made preparations. Then he saw the statue on the tall column. I will put up there, he cried. It is a fine position with plenty of fresh air. So he alighted just between the feet of the happy prince. I have a golden bedroom, he said softly to himself as he looked round, and he prepared to go to sleep. But just as he was putting his head under his wing, a large drop of water fell on him. What a curious thing, he cried. There is not a single cloud in the sky. The stars are quite clear and bright, and yet it is raining. The climate in the north of Europe is really dreadful. The reed used to like the rain, but that was merely her selfishness. Then another drop fell. What is the use of a statue if it cannot keep the rain off? he said. I must look for a good chimney pot. And he determined to fly away. But before he had opened his wings, a third drop fell, and he looked up and saw. Oh, what did he see? The eyes of the happy prince were filled with tears, and tears were running down his golden cheeks. His face was so beautiful in the moonlight that the little swallow was filled with pity. Who are you? he said. I am the happy prince. Why are you weeping then? asked the swallow. You have quite drenched me. When I was alive and had a human heart, answered the statue, I did not know what tears were, for I lived in the palace of Sans Souci, where sorrow is not allowed to enter. In the daytime I played with my companions in the garden, and in the evening I led the dance in the great hall. Round the garden ran a very lofty wall, but I never cared to ask what lay beyond it. Everything about me was so beautiful. My courtiers called me the happy prince, and happy indeed I was. If pleasure be happiness. So I lived, and so I died. And now that I am dead, they have set me up here so high that I can see all the ugliness and all the misery of my city, and though my heart is made of lead, yet I cannot choose but weep. What? He is not solid gold, said the swallow to himself. He was too polite to make any personal remarks out loud. Far away, continued the statue in a low musical voice, far away in a little street there is a poor house. One of the windows is open, and through it I can see a woman seated at a table. Her face is thin and worn and she has coarse red hands, all pricked by the needle, for she is a seamstress. She is embroidering passion flowers on a satin gown for the loveliest of the queen's maids of honor to wear at the next court ball. In a bed in the corner of the room, her little boy is lying ill. He has a fever and is asking for oranges. His mother has nothing to give him but river water. So he is crying. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, will you not bring her the ruby out of my sword hilt? My feet are fastened to this pedestal, and I cannot move. I am awaited for in Egypt, said the swallow. My friends are flying up and down the Nile and talking to the large lotus flowers. Soon, they will go to sleep in the tomb of the great king. The king is there himself in a painted coffin. He is wrapped in yellow linen and embalmed with spices. Round his neck is a chain of pale green jade, and his hands are like withered leaves. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. 
Will you not stay with me for one night and be my messenger? The boy is so thirsty, and the mother so sad. I don't think I like boys, answered the swallow. Last summer, when I was staying on the river, there were two rude boys, the miller's sons, who were always throwing stones at me. They never hit me, of course. We swallows fly far too well for that, and besides, I come from a family famous for its agility. But still, it was a mark of disrespect. But the happy prince looked so sad that the little swallow was sorry. It is very cold here, he said. But I will stay with you for one night and be your messenger. Thank you, little swallow, said the prince. So the swallow picked out the great ruby from the prince's sword and flew away with it in his beak over the roofs of the town. He passed by the cathedral tower where the white marble angels were sculptured. He passed by the palace and heard the sound of dancing. A beautiful girl came out on the balcony with her lover. How wonderful the stars are, he said to her, and how wonderful is the power of love. I hope my dress will be ready in time for the state ball, she answered. I have ordered passion flowers to be embroidered on it, but the seamstresses are so lazy. He passed over the river and saw the lanterns hanging to the mast of the ships. He passed over the ghetto, and saw the old Jews bargaining with each other, and weighing out money in copper scales. At last he came to the poorhouse and looked in. The boy was tossing feverishly on his bed, and the mother had fallen asleep. She was so tired. In he hopped, and laid the great ruby on the table beside the woman's thimble. Then he flew gently around the bed, fanning the boy's forehead with his wings. "'How cool I feel,' said the boy. "'I must be getting better.' And he sank into a delicious slumber. Then the swallow flew back to the happy prince and told him what he had done. "'It is curious,' he remarked. "'But I feel quite warm now, although it is so cold.' "'That is because you have done a good action,' said the prince. And the little swallow began to think— and then he fell asleep. Thinking always made him sleepy. When day broke, he flew down to the river and had a bath. "'What a remarkable phenomenon!' said the professor of ornithology as he was passing over the bridge. "'A swallow in winter!' And he wrote a long letter about it to the local newspaper. Everyone quoted it. It was full of so many words that they could not understand. "'Tonight I go to Egypt!' said the swallow, and he was in high spirits at the prospect. He visited all the public monuments, and sat a long time at the top of the church steeple. Wherever he went, the spirits chirruped, and said to each other, "'What a distinguished stranger!' He so enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. "'Have you any commissions for Egypt?' he cried. "'I am just starting!' "'Swallow!' "'Swallow, little swallow,' said the prince, "'will you not stay with me one night longer?' "'I am waited for in Egypt,' answered the swallow. "'Tomorrow my friends will fly up to the second cataract. "'The river horse couches there among the bulrushes, "'and on a great granite throne sits the god Menon. "'All night long he watches the stars, "'and when the morning star shines he utters one cry of joy, "'and then he is silent.' At noon, the yellow lions come down to the water's edge to drink. They have eyes like green barrels, and their roar is louder than the roar of the cataract. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away across the city, I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over a desk covered with papers, and in a tumbler by his side there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are as red as a pomegranate, and he has large and dreamy eyes. He is trying to finish a play for the director of the theatre, but he is too cold to write any more. There is no fire in the grate, and hunger has made him faint. 
I will wait with you for one night longer, said the swallow, who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now, said the prince. My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires, which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck out one of them and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweler and buy food and firewood and finish his play. Dear Prince, said the swallow, I cannot do that. And he began to weep. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. So the swallow plucked out the prince's eye and flew away to the student's garret. It was easy enough to get in, as there was a hole in the roof. Through this he darted and came into the room. The young man had his head buried in his hands, so he did not hear the flutter of the bird's wings. And when he looked up, he found the beautiful sapphire lying on the withered violets. "'I am beginning to be appreciated!' he cried. "'This is from some great admirer! Now I can finish my play!' And he looked quite happy. The next day the swallow flew down to the harbor. He sat on the mast of a large vessel, and watched the sailors hauling big chests out of the hold with ropes. Heave a ho! they shouted as each chest came up. I am going to Egypt! cried the swallow, but nobody minded, and when the moon rose he flew back to the happy prince. I am come to bid you good-bye! he cried. Swallow! Swallow! Little swallow! said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? It is winter, answered the swallow, and the chill snow will soon be here. In Egypt the sun is warm, on the green palm trees, and the crocodiles lie in the mud and look lazily about them. My companions are building a nest in the temple of Baalbek, and the pink and white doves are watching them and cooing to each other. Dear prince, I must leave you, but I will never forget you, and the next spring I will bring you back two beautiful jewels, in place of those that you have given away. The ruby shall be redder than a red rose, and the sapphire shall be as blue as the great sea. In the square below, said the happy prince, there stands a little match girl. She has let her matches fall into the gutter, and they are all spoiled. Her father will beat her if she does not come home with some money, and she is crying. She has no shoes or stockings, and her little head is bare. Pluck out my other eye and give it to her, and her father will not beat her. I will stay with you one night longer, said the swallow. But I cannot pluck out your eye. You would be quite blind then. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Do as I command you. So he plucked out the prince's other eye and darted down with it. He swooped past the match girl and slipped the jewel into the palm of her hand. What a lovely bit of glass! cried the little girl, and she ran home laughing. Then the swallow came back to the prince. You are blind now, he said, so I will stay with you always. No, little swallow, said the poor prince, you must go away to Egypt. I will stay with you always said the swallow, and he slept at the prince's feet. All the next day he sat on the prince's shoulder, and told him stories of what he had seen in strange lands. He told him of the red ibises, who stand in long rows on the banks of the Nile, and catch goldfish in their beaks, of the sphinx, who is as old as the world itself, and lives in the desert, and knows everything of the merchants who walk slowly by the side of their camels and carry amber beads in their hands of the king of the mountains of the moon who is as black as ebony and worships a large crystal of the great green snake that sleeps in a palm tree and has twenty priests to feed it with honey cakes and of the pygmies who sail over the big lake on large flat leaves and are always at war with the butterflies Dear little swallow, said the prince, you tell me of marvelous things, but more marvelous than anything is the suffering of men and women. There is no mystery so great as misery. Fly over my city, little swallow, 
and tell me what you see there. So the swallow flew over the great city, and saw the rich making merry in their beautiful houses, while the beggars were sitting at the gates. He flew into dark lanes, and saw the white faces of starving children looking out listlessly at the black streets. Under the archway of a bridge, two little boys were lying in one another's arms, to try and keep themselves warm. "'How hungry we are!' they said. "'You must not lie here!' shouted the watchman, and they wandered out into the rain. Then he flew back and told the prince what he had seen. "'I am covered with fine gold,' said the prince. "'You must take it off, leaf by leaf, and give it to my poor. The living always think that gold can make them happy.' Leaf after leaf of the fine gold the swallow picked off, till the happy prince looked quite dull and gray. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold he brought to the poor, and the children's faces grew rosier and they laughed and played games in the street. "'We have bread nod!' they cried. Then the snow came, and after the snow came the frost. The streets looked as if they were made of silver. They were so bright and glistening. Long icicles, like crystal daggers, hung down from the eaves of the houses. Everybody went about in furs, and the little boys wore scarlet caps and skated on the ice. The poor little swallow grew colder and colder, but he would not leave the prince. He loved him too well. He picked up crumbs outside the baker's door, when the baker was not looking, and tried to keep himself warm by flapping his wings. But at last he knew that he was going to die. He had just strength to fly up to the prince's shoulder once more. "'Good-bye, dear prince,' he murmured. Will you let me kiss your hand? I am glad that you are going to Egypt at last, little swallow, said the prince. You have stayed here too long, but you must kiss me on the lips, for I love you. It is not to Egypt that I am going, said the swallow. I am going to the house of death. Death is the brother of sleep, is he not? And he kissed the happy prince on the lips and fell down dead at his feet. At that moment a curious crack sounded inside the statue, as if something had broken. The fact is that the leaden heart had snapped right in two. It certainly was a dreadfully hard frost. Early the next morning the mayor was walking in the square below, in company with the town councillors. As they passed the column he looked up at the statue. "'Dear me! How shabby the happy prince looks!' he said. "'How, how shabby, shabby indeed!' indeed cried the town councillors, who always agreed with the mayor, and they went up to look at it. "'The ruby has fallen out of his sword, his eyes are gone, and he is golden no longer,' said the mayor. "'In fact, he is little better than a beggar.' "'Little, little better, better than, than a beggar,' beggar said the town councillors. "'And there is actually a dead bird at his feet,' continued the mayor. "'We must really issue a proclamation that birds are not to be allowed to die here.' And the town clerk made a note of the suggestion. So they pulled down the statue of the happy prince. "'As <clears throat> he is no longer beautiful, he is no longer useful,' said the art professor at the university." Then they melted the statue in a furnace, and the mayor held a meeting of the corporation to decide what was to be done with the metal. "'We must have another statue, of course,' he said, "'and it shall be a statue of myself.' "'Of, of myself,' myself!' said each town councillor, and they quarrelled. When last I heard of them, they were quarrelling still. "'What a strange thing!' said the overseer of the workmen at the foundry. This broken lead heart will not melt in the furnace. We must throw it away. So they threw it on the dust heap, where the dead swallow was also lying. Bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels. And the angel brought him 
the leaden heart, and the dead bird. You have rightly chosen, said God, for in my garden of paradise this little bird shall sing for evermore, and in my city of gold the happy prince shall praise me. End of The Happy Prince Recording by Lisa Hirschbach Big Lake, Alaska The Foolish Wolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com Reading by Bologna Times The Foolish Wolf by William Crook For the Children's Literary Collection A wolf and an ass were great friends, and they spent most of their time playing at an original game of their own. The game was easy enough to learn. You could play it yourselves, and it was this. First the ass used to run away from the wolf as hard as he could, and the wolf used to follow, and then the wolf would run as hard as he could from the ass, and the ass would follow. One day, as the wolf was running away full tilt from the ass, a boy saw them. Ha, 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 said the boy, what a coward that wolf is to run away from an ass. He thought, you see, that the wolf was afraid of being eaten by the ass. The wolf heard him and was very angry. He stopped short, and said to the boy, "'So you think I am a coward, little boy? You shall rue the word. I'm brave enough to eat you, as you shall find out this very night, for I will come and carry you off from your home.' If the wolf was no coward, at least he was a foolish wolf to tell the boy if he meant to carry him off, as I think you will agree with me." The boy went home to tell his mother. Mother, said he, a wolf is coming to-night to carry me off. Oh, never mind if he does, said the boy's mother. He won't hurt you. The boy did not feel quite so sure about that, for he had seen sharp teeth in the mouth of the wolf, so he chose out a big and sharp stone and put it in his pocket. Why he did not hide I can't tell you, for he never told me, but my private opinion is he was almost as foolish as the wolf. Well, when night came, the boy's mother went to bed, and was soon snoring, but the boy stayed up to wait for the wolf. About ten o'clock came a knock at the door. Come in, said the boy. The wolf opened the door, and came in, and says he, Now, boy, you must come along with me. All right, says the boy. Mother doesn't mind. I have never been able to understand why his mother did not mind, but perhaps he was a very naughty boy, and she was glad to get rid of him. If he did nothing but pull his sister's hair and put spiders down their necks, he was just as well out of the house, I think. So the boy got on the wolf's back, and the wolf trotted off briskly to his den. Then the wolf thought to himself, I have had my dinner, and I don't want any boy to-night. Suppose I leave him for to-morrow, and go for a spin with my friend the jackass. So he left the boy in his den, and off he went after the jackass. What makes me think more than ever that he was a foolish wolf is that he never even tied the boy's legs together. So when the wolf was gone, the boy went out of the den, and climbed up a tree. In an hour or two back came the wolf, ready for bed. He looked in at the mouth of the den, but no boy. "'Where on earth has that boy got to?' said he. "'I left him here safe and sound. It never occurred to this wolf that legs can walk and boys can climb trees.' He felt very anxious, and as many people do when their wits are puzzled, he opened his mouth wide. The boy saw him standing at the opening of the den, with his mouth wide open, so he pulled the sharp stone out of his pocket and threw it in. The boy was a very good shot with the stone, and the stone went straight into the wolf's inside and cut his inside so much that he died. Then the boy climbed down from the tree, and he was at home in time for breakfast. 
I don't know whether his mother was pleased to see him or not, but there he was, and there he stayed, and if he has not gone away, he is there still. End of The Foolish Wolf by William Crook As retold by W. H. Drouse Little Red Riding Hood by Raphael Tuck and Sons this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taylor Arnett. Little Red Riding Hood by Raphael Tuck and Sons. This dear little girl of whom you've heard, one day her granny to see with flowers in hand and basket on arm when carrying cakes for tea. But alack, alack, before she had gone but a half a mile through the woods, a wicked old wolf with manners grand spoke to our Red Riding Hood. She told him that she was going to see her granny she loved so dear. Red Riding Hood visits her granny, who lived in a sweet little cottage which stood in a lane quite near. Then away he ran to the cottage. He had found granny had gone to town. So himself he dressed in all of her best, her cap and smart Sunday gown. Red Riding Hood came to her granny's and was much surprised when there to see grandmother working with hands all covered with hair. Why, granny, how changed you are! And her face was so brown and ugly, her ears were so long and queer. She made poor Red Riding Hood tremble and shake in her shoes for fear. How do you change, dear granny? she faltered. Why, you've tea so large and white. She knew twas the wolf when he answered, The better, my dear, to bite. And the wolf would really have killed her, but she jumped out of the bed, and before he could manage to catch her, had home to her mother she fled. And the wolf, I am glad to tell you soon after, was firmly bound by a huntsman and two, and sent to the zoo, and there, to this day, may be found. End of Little Red Riding Hood Recording by Taylor Arnett The Goblin's Christmas by Elizabeth Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aubrey Kirkham the goblin's christmas once upon a time i visited fairyland and spent a day in goblin town the people there are very much like ourselves only they are very very small and roguish they play pranks on one another and have great fun they are good-natured and jolly and rarely get angry but if one does get angry he quickly recovers his good nature and joins again in the sport if a goblin should continue angry, he would take on some visible form. Perhaps he would become a toad or a squirrel or some other little animal and would have to live here on the earth plain forevermore. But if he keeps good-natured, he can come here and have his fun and not be seen by anyone except a seer or a very wise person. The goblins are gracious to the wise people now, but they were not always so. A long, long time ago, on a Christmas Eve, the fairy folk were having great sport. All the little people of the unseen world had gathered together in the earth realm. There were brownies and gnomes and elves. Even some little cherubs had joined them. They were having a wild dance and a gay time when who should appear but Kris Kringle. Now the fairies did not know that he was a, mag a magician or seer, and so they tried to make sport of him. But Chris, by his wonderful magic, changed them into the most beautiful toys. They became straight little jumping jacks, and dolls in bright dresses, and the dearest little rabbit with white, soft fur. And somewhere in the bottom of the sleigh, one was turned into a cute little teddy bear. Then old Chris tucked all these toys into his roomy sleigh, and shook the reins of his waiting steed. Go on, he said, for I've many, many a chimney to reach tonight. Now this is the tale of the Goblin's Christmas, 
that the moonbeams told, as they heard it from the fairy queen, who declares that every word of it is perfectly true. The big bright moon hung high and round, in a densely darkened sky. The tall pines swayed and mocked and groaned. The mountains grew so high that the man in the moon came out and said, Ho, spooks, for a merry dance! The winds blow hard, the caverns roar, while o'er the earth they prance. A witch and a goblin led the sprites, out from the sky they sprung, and down the milky way they slid, and over a chasm swung. The streams around ran witch's broth, the fumes were strong and rank, these elfish creatures all were wroth, while of the stuff they drank. The cunning moon looked on and laughed, with a shrill and sneering jibe. Her soul grew fat to see them chaffed, this mad and elfish tribe. The big black cauldron boiled so high with food for these queer mites, that it lit the world throughout the sky, and down came all the sprites. Their mad career upset a star, as through the air they flew. It cringed in fear and shot afar, and fell where no one knew. Orion's sword was broken bits, Corona's crown was gone. Capella seemed to lose her wits, while all so longed for dawn. Then from the night there came a sound of sleigh bells ringing sweet. Out of the chaos came a man, Chris Kringle, for his Christmas treat. Ho, oh, Chris, they cried, we'll have some fun, we'll bind the old man down. We'll tie him up and toss him o'er into our goblin town. They climbed the sleigh with shout and din to bind his hands and feet. A hundred strong they clambered in, our good old Chris to meet. He sat quite still with twinkling eyes, then seized his magic wand. He raised it up and waved it round. Stilled was this chattering band. Stiffly stark and still they stood, clad in elfish clothes. Some were wax and some were wood. One had crushed his nose. Playthings rare, he said and smiled, for children rich and poor. Some all leave the crippled child, and some at the orphan's door. He shook his reins and called his steed to bear him swiftly on, Full well it knew its master's need, to hurry ere the dawn. From house to house they scampered down, their sleigh bells ringing clear, Through chimneys in the sleeping town, good Chris and his reindeer. The windows rattled, the moonbeams tattled, a tale so strange and queer. They told how at night, in dire affright, the moon had hid in fear, That he'd called in sport his elfish court, of spooks and witches gay, each elfin child by glee beguiled brought scores of others, they say. Then a man appeared with flowing beard in a sled with a reindeer fleet. They gathered about with din and shout to bind him hands and feet. Then the moon laughed loud at the gathering crowd while he held his sides in mirth to see old Chris in a plight like this toiling over the earth. But alas for the moon, he had laughed like a loon, for Chris is a hero of old. Yes, Chris is a seer, with his small reindeer, he captured the goblins bold. And he changed them, they say, in a wonderful way, to toys for his Christmas cheer. The big dolls stare with a goblin air, the small ones cringe with fear. While the moonbeams prattle, I hear a rattle of hoofs on the chimney side. Then out on the snow, I gaze below, hurrah, it's Chris Kringle, I cried. Then sly as a mouse, he entered the house, and hung up his treasures so gay. Then out with a dash, he sped like a flash, into the night and away. End of The Goblin's Christmas By Elizabeth Anderson This recording is in the public domain. Read by Aubrey Kirkham Uncle Frank's Series, Old Mother Hubbard, by McLaughlin Brothers Publishers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Madeline Rydberg. Old Mother Hubbard and Her Dog. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard 
to give her poor dog a bone. When she came there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog had none. She went to the tavern for white wine and red. When she came back, the dog stood on his head. She brought him a cake, which she bought at the fair. When she came back, the dog sat in a chair. She went to the baker's to buy him some bread, but when she came back, poor doggy was dead. She went to the undertaker's to buy him a coffin. When she came back, the dog was laughing. She took a clean dish to get him some tripe. When she came back, he was smoking his pipe. She went to the tailor's to buy him a coat. When she came back, he was riding a goat. She went to the fruiterer's to buy him some fruit. When she came back, he was playing the flute. She went to the barber's to buy him a wig. When she came back, he was dancing a jig. She went to the cobbler's to buy him some shoes. When she came back, he was reading the news. She went to the hatter's to buy him a hat. When she came back, he was feeding her cat. She went to the seamstress to buy him some linen. When she came back, the dog was spinning. She went to the hosers to buy him some hose. When she came back, he was dressed in his clothes. The dame made a curtsy. The dog made a bow. The dame said, "Your servant." The dog said, "Bow wow." End of Uncle Frank's series, Old Mother Hubbard, by McLaughlin Brothers Publishing. Prince Hyacinth and the Dear Little Princess. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Prince Hyacinth and the Dear Little Princess by Andrew Lang. For the LibriVox Children's Short Story Collection. Once upon a time there lived a king who was deeply in love with a princess, but she could not marry any one because she was under an enchantment. So the king set out to seek a fairy and asked what he could do to win the princess's love. The fairy said to him, "You know that the princess has a great cat which she is very fond of. Whoever is clever enough to tread on that cat's tail is the man she is destined to marry." The king said to himself that this would not be very difficult, and he left the fairy determined to grind the cat's tail to powder rather than not tread on it at all. You may imagine that it was not long before he went to see the princess, and Puss, as usual, marched in before him, arching his back. The king took a long step and quite thought he had the tail under his foot, but the cat turned round so sharply that he only trod on air. And so it went on for eight days, till the king began to think that this fatal tale must be full of quicksilver. It was never still for a moment. At last, however, he was lucky enough to come upon Puss fast asleep, and with his tail conveniently spread out. So the king, without losing a moment, set his foot upon it heavily, with one terrific yell. Rawr! The cat sprang up and instantly. Changed into a tall man, who, fixing his angry eyes upon the king, said, "You shall marry the princess because you have been able to break the enchantment. But I will have my revenge. You shall have a son who will never be happy until he finds out that his nose is too long. And if you ever tell any one what I have just said to you, you shall vanish away instantly, and no one shall ever see you or hear of you again." Though the king was. Horribly afraid of the enchanter, he could not help laughing at his threat. Ha! If my son has such a long nose as that, he said to himself, he must always see it or feel it at least, if he is not blind or without hands. But as the enchanter had vanished, he did not waste any more time in thinking, but went to see the princess, who very soon consented to marry him. But after all. 
they had not been married very long when the king died and the queen had nothing left to care for but her little son who was called hyacinth the little prince had large blue eyes the prettiest eyes in the world and a sweet little mouth but alas his nose was so enormous that it covered half his face the queen was inconsolable when she saw this great nose but her ladies assured her that it was not really as large as it looked that it was a roman nose and you had only to open any history to see that every hero has a large nose the queen who was devoted to her baby was pleased with what they told her and when she looked at hyacinth again his nose certainly did not seem to her quite so large the prince was brought up with great care and as soon as he could speak they told him all sorts of dreadful stories about people who had short noses no one was allowed to come near him whose nose did not more or less resemble his own and the courtiers to get into favor with the queen took to pulling their babies noses several times every day to make them grow long but do what they would they were nothing by comparison with the princes when he grew sensible he learned history and whenever any great prince or beautiful princess was spoken of his teachers took care to tell him that they had long noses his room was hung with pictures all of people with very large noses and the prince grew up so convinced that a long nose was a great beauty that he would not on any account have had his own a single inch shorter when his twentieth birthday was passed the queen thought it was time that he should be married so she commanded that the portraits of several princesses should be brought for him to see and among the others was a picture of the dear little princess now she was the daughter of a great king and would some day possess several kingdoms herself but prince hyacinth had not a thought to spare for anything of that sort he was so much struck with her beauty the princess whom he thought quite charming had however a little saucy nose which in her face was the prettiest thing possible but it was a cause of great embarrassment to the courtiers who had got into such a habit of laughing at little noses that they sometimes found themselves laughing at hers before they had time to think but this did not do at all before the prince who quite failed to see the joke and actually banished two of his courtiers who had dared to mention disrespectfully the dear little princess's tiny nose the others taking warning from this learned to think twice before they spoke and one even went so far as to tell the prince that though it was quite true that no man could be worth anything unless he had a long nose still a woman's beauty was a different thing and he knew a learned man who understood greek and had read in some old manuscripts that the beautiful cleopatra herself had a tip-tilted nose the prince made him a splendid present as a reward for this good news and at once sent ambassadors to ask the dear little princess in marriage the king her father gave his consent and prince hyacinth who in his anxiety to see the princess had gone three leagues to meet her was just advancing to kiss her hand when to the horror of all who stood by the enchanter appeared as suddenly as a flash of lightning and snatching up the dear little princess whirled her away out of their sight the prince was left quite unconsolable and declared that nothing should induce him to go back to his kingdom until he had found her again and refusing to allow any of her courtiers to follow him he mounted his horse and rode sadly away letting the animal choose his own path so it happened that he came presently to a great plain across which he rode all day long without seeing a single house and horse and rider were terribly hungry when as the night fell the prince caught sight of a light which seemed to shine from a cavern he rode up to it and saw a little old woman who appeared to be at least a hundred years old she put on her spectacles to look at prince hyacinth but it was quite a long time before she could fix them securely because her nose was so very short the prince and the fairy for that was who she was had no sooner looked at one another that they went into fits of laughter and cried at the same moment 
Oh, what a funny nose! Not so funny as your own, said Prince Hyacinth to the fairy. But, madam, I beg you to leave the consideration of, of our noses, such as they are, and to be good enough to give me something to eat, for I am starving, and so is my poor horse. With all my heart, said the fairy, though your nose is so ridiculous, you are, nevertheless, the son of my best friend. I loved your father as if he had been my brother. Now he had a very handsome nose. And pray, what does mine lack? said the prince. Oh, it doesn't lack anything, replied the fairy. On the contrary, quite, there is only too much of it. But never mind, one may be a very worthy man, though his nose is too long. I was telling you that I was your father's friend. He often came to see me in the old times, and you must know that I was very pretty in those days. At least he used to say so. I should like to tell you of a conversation we had the last time I ever saw him. Indeed, said the prince, when I have supped, it will give me the greatest pleasure to hear it. But consider, madam, I beg of you, that I have had nothing to eat to-day. The poor boy is right, said the fairy. I was forgetting. Come in, then, and I will give you some supper. And while you are eating, I can tell you my story in a very few words, for I don't like endless tales myself. Too long a tongue is worse than too long a nose, and I remember when I was young that I was so much admired for not being a great chatterer. They used to tell the queen, my mother, that it was so, for though you see what I am now, I was the daughter of a great king. Your father, I dare say, got something to eat when he was hungry, interrupted the prince. Oh, certainly, answered the fairy, and you also shall have supper directly. I only just wanted to tell you. But I really cannot listen to anything until I have had something to eat, cried the prince, who was getting quite angry. But then, remembering that he had better be polite, as he much needed the fairy's help, he added, I know that in the pleasure of listening to you I should quite forget my own hunger, but my horse, who cannot hear you, must really be fed. The fairy was very much flattered by this compliment, and said, calling to her servants, you shall not wait another minute, you are so polite, and in spite of the enormous size of your nose, you are really very agreeable. Plague take the old lady! How she does go on about my nose! said the prince to himself. One would almost think that mine had taken all the extra length that hers lacks. If I were not so hungry, I would soon have done with this chatterpie, who thinks she talks very little. How stupid people are not to see their own faults! That comes of being a princess. She has been spoiled by flatterers, who have made her believe that she is quite a moderate talker. Meanwhile, the servants were putting the supper on the table, and the prince was much amused to hear the fairy, who asked them a thousand questions simply for the pleasure of hearing herself speak. Especially, he noticed, one maid, who, no matter what was being said, always contrived to praise her mistress's wisdom. Well, he thought, as he ate his supper, I'm very glad I came here. This just shows me how sensible I have been in never listening to flatterers. People of that sort praise us to our faces, without shame, and hide our faults, or change them into virtues. For my part, I never will be taken in by them. I know my own defects, I hope. Poor Prince Hyacinth, he really believed what he said, and hadn't an idea that the people who had praised his nose were laughing at him, just as the fairy's maid was laughing at her, for the prince had seen her laugh slyly when she could do so, without the fairy's noticing her. However, he said nothing, and presently, when his hunger began to be appeased, the fairy said, My dear prince, might I beg you to move a little more that way, for your nose casts such a shadow that I really cannot see what I have on my plate. Ah, thanks. Now let us speak of your father. When I went to his court he was only a little boy, but that is forty years ago, and I have been in this desolate place ever since. Tell me what goes on nowadays. Are the ladies as fond of amusement as ever? In my time one saw them at parties, theatres, balls, and promenades, every day. Dear me, what a long nose you have! I cannot get used to it. Really, madam, 
said the prince, I wish you would leave off mentioning my nose. It cannot matter to you what it is like. I am quite satisfied with it, and have no wish to have it shorter. One must take what is given one. Now you are angry with me, my poor Hyacinth, said the fairy, and I assure you that I didn't mean to vex you. On the contrary, I wish to do you a service. However, though I really cannot help your nose being a shock to me, I will try not to say anything about it. I will even try to think that you have an ordinary nose. To tell the truth, it would make three reasonable ones. The prince, who was no longer hungry, grew so impatient at the fairy's continual remarks about his nose, that at last he threw himself upon his horse and rode hastily away. But wherever he came in his journeyings, he thought the people were mad, for they all talked of his nose, and yet he could not bring himself to admit that it was too long. He had been so used all his life to hear it called handsome. The old fairy, who wished to make him happy, at last hit upon a plan. She shut the dear little princess up in a palace of crystal, and put this palace down where the prince would not fail to find it. His joy at seeing the princess again was extreme, and he set to work with all his might to try to break her prison. But in spite of all his efforts, he failed utterly. In despair, he thought at least that he would try to get near enough to speak to the dear little princess, who, on her part, stretched out her hand that he might kiss it, but turn which way he might. He never could raise it to his lips, for his long nose always prevented it. For the first time he realized how long it really was, and exclaimed, "'Well, it must be admitted that my nose is too long.' In an instant the crystal prison flew into a thousand splinters, and the old fairy, taking the dear little princess by the hand, said to the prince, "'Now say if you are not very much obliged to me. Much good it was for me to talk to you about your nose. You would never have found out how extraordinary it was if it hadn't hindered you from doing what you wanted to. You see how self-love keeps us from knowing our own defects of mind and body. Our reason tries in vain to show them to us. We refuse to see them till we find them in the way of our interests. Prince Hyacinth, whose nose was now just like any one's else, did not fail to profit by the lesson he had received. He married the dear little princess, and they lived happily ever after. End of Prince Hyacinth and the Dear Little Princess A Moral Alphabet by Hilaire Belloc This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Algie Pug A Moral Alphabet by Hilaire Belloc a for Archibald. A stands for Archibald, who told no lies, and got this lovely volume for a prize. The upper school had combed and oiled their hair, and all the parents of the boys were there. In words that ring like thunder through the hall, draw tears from some, and loud applause from all, the pedagogue, with pardonable joy, bestows the gift upon the radiant boy. Except the noblest work produced as yet, says he, upon the English alphabet. Next term I shall examine you to find, if you have read it thoroughly, so mine. And while the boys and parents cheered so loud, that out of doors a large and anxious crowd had gathered, and was blocking up the street, the admirable child resumed his seat. Moral. Learn from this justly irritating you, to brush your hair and teeth, and tell the truth. B for bear. B stands for bear. When bears are seen approaching in the distance, make up your mind at once between retreat and armed resistance. A gentleman remained to fight. With what result for him? The bear, with ill-concealed delight, devoured him limb by limb. Another person turned and ran. He ran extremely hard. The bear was faster than the man, and beat him by a yard. 
Moral. Decisive action in the hour of need denotes the hero, but does not succeed. C for cobra. C stands for cobra. When the cobra bites an Indian judge, the judge spends restless nights. Moral. This creature, though disgusting and appalling, conveys no kind of moral worth recalling. D for dreadful. The dreadful dinotherium. He will have to do his best for D. The early world observed with awe his back, indented like a saw. His look was gay, his voice was strong, his tail was neither short nor long. His trunk, or elongated nose, was not so large as some suppose. His teeth, as all the world allows, were graminivorous, like a cow. He therefore would have wished to pass long peaceful nights upon the grass, but being mad, the brute preferred to roost in branches like a bird. We have good reason to suppose he did so from his claw-like toes. A creature heavier than a whale, you see at once, could hardly fail to suffer badly when he slid and tumbled, as he always did. His fossil, therefore, comes to light all broken up and serve him right. Moral. If you are born to walk the ground, remain there. Do not fool around. E for egg. E stands for egg. Moral. The moral of this verse is applicable to the young. Be terse. F for family. F for a family. Taking a walk in Arcadia Terrace, no doubt. The parents indulge in intelligent talk, while the children they gamble about. At quarter past six they return to their tea of a kind that would hardly be tempting to me. Though my appetite passes belief, there is jam, ginger beer, buttered toast, marmalade, with a cold leg of mutton and warm lemonade, and a large pigeon pie very skilfully made to consist almost wholly of beef. Moral. A respectable family taking the air is a subject on which I could dwell. It contains all the morals that ever there were, and it sets an example as well. G for new. G stands for new, whose weapons of defence are long, sharp, curling horns, and common sense. To these he adds a name so short and strong, that even hardy boors pronounce it wrong. How often on a bright autumnal day the pious people of Pretoria say, Come, let us hunt the... Then no more is heard, but sounds of strong men struggling with a word. Meanwhile, the distant new, with grateful eyes, observes his opportunity and flies. Moral. Child, if you have a rummy kind of name, Remember to be thankful for the same. H for horseman. H was a horseman who rode to the meet and talked to the pads of the fox as his feet. An error which furnished subscribers with grounds for refusing to make him a master of hounds. He gave way thereupon to so fearful a rage that he sold up his stable and went on the stage and had all the success that a man could desire in creating a part of the old English squire. Moral. In the learned professions, a person should know the advantage of having two strings to his bow. I. For India. I, the poor Indian, justly called the poor. He has to eat his dinner off the floor. Moral. The moral these delightful lines afford is, living cheaply is its own reward. J for James. J stands for James, who thought it immaterial to pay his taxes, local or imperial. In vain the mother wept, the wife implored. James only yawned, as though a trifle bored. The tax collector called again, but he was met with persiflage and repartee. When James was hauled before the learned judge, who lectured him, he loudly whispered, Fudge! The judge was startled from his usual calm. 
he struck the desk before him with his palm and roared in tones to make the boldest quail j stands for james it also stands for jail and therefore on a dark and dreadful day policemen came and took him all away moral the fate of james is typical and shows how little mercy people can expect who will not pay their taxes saving those to which they conscientiously object k for klondike k for the klondike a country of gold where the winters are often excessively cold where the lawn every morning is covered with rime and skating continues for years at a time do you think that a climate can conquer the grit of the sons of the west not a bit not a bit when the weather looks nippy the bold pioneers put on two pairs of stockings and cover their ears and roam through the drear hyperborean dales with a vast apparatus of buckets and pails or wander through wild hyperborean glades with hoes, hammers, pickaxes, matlocks, and spades. There are some who give rise to exuberant mirth by turning up nothing but bushels of earth, while those who have little cause excellent fun by attempting to pilfer from those who have none. At times the reward they will get for their pains is to strike very tempting auriferous veins, or a shaft being sunk for some miles in the ground, not infrequently nuggets of value are found. They bring us the gold when their labours are ended, and we, after thanking them prettily, spend it. Moral. Just you work for humanity. Never you mind if humanity seems to have left you behind. L for lady. L was a lady, advancing in age, who drove in her carriage and six, with a couple of footmen, a coachman and a page, who were all of them regular bricks. If the coach ran away, or was smashed by a dray, or got into collisions and blocks, the page, with a courtesy rare for his years, would leap to the ground with inspiriting cheers, while a footman allayed her legitimate fears, and a coachman sat tight on his box. At night, as they met round an excellent meal, they would take it in turn to observe, what a lady indeed! What a presence to feel! What a woman to worship and serve! But perhaps the most poignant of all their delights was to stand in a rapturous dream when she spoke to them kindly on Saturday nights and said, They deserved her esteem. Moral. Now observe the reward of these dutiful lives. At the end of their loyal career they each had a lodge at the end of the drives, and she left them a hundred a year. Remember from this to be properly vexed when the newspaper editors say that the tie of society shown in the text is rapidly passing away. M for millionaire. M was a millionaire who sat at table and ate like this as long as he was able. At half past twelve the waiters turned him out. He lived impoverished and died of gout. Moral disgusting exhibition have a care when later on you are a millionaire to rise from table feeling you could still take something more and not be really ill n for ned n stands for ned maria's younger brother who walking one way chose to gaze the other in blandford square a crowded part of town two people on a tandem knocked him down whereat a motor-car, with warning shout, ran on top and turned him inside out. The damages that he obtained from these maintained him all his life in cultured ease. Moral. The law protects you. Go your gentle way. The other man has always got to pay. O for Oxford. O stands for Oxford. Hail, salubrious seat of learning, academical retreat home of my middle age malarial spot which people call medieval though it's not the marshes in the neighbourhood can vie with cambridge but the town itself is dry and serves to make a kind of fold or pen 
wherein to herd a lot of learned men. Were I to write but half of what they know, it would exhaust the space reserved for O. And as my book must not be over big, I turn at once to P, which stands for peak. Moral. Be taught by this to speak with moderation of places where, with decent application, one gets a good sound middle-class education. P for peak. P stands for peak, as I remarked before, a second cousin to the huge wild boar. But pigs are civilized while huge wild boars leap savagely at random out of doors, and in their coarse contempt for dainty foods, subsist on truffles which they find in woods, not so the cultivated pig, who feels the need of several courses at his meal, but wrongly thinks it does not matter whether he takes them one by one or all together. Hence pigs devour, from lack of self-respect, what epicures would certainly reject. Moral. Learn from the pig to take whatever fate or elder persons heap upon your plate. Q for quinine. Q for quinine, which children take with jam and little bits of cake. Moral. How idiotic. Can quinine replace cold baths and sound hygiene? R for reviewer. Ah, the reviewer, in reviewing my book, at which he had barely intended to look, but the very first lines upon A were enough to convince him the verses were excellent stuff, so he wrote without stopping for several days, in terms of extreme but well-merited praise. To quote but one passage, No person, says he, will be really content without purchasing three, while a parent will send for a dozen or more, and strew them about on the nursery floor. The versification might call for some strictures, were it not for its singular wit, while the pictures, though handling of line is a little defective, make up amply in verve what they lack in perspective. Moral. The habit of constantly telling the truth will lend an additional lustre to youth. S for snail. S stands for snail, who, though he be the least, is not an uninstructive horned beast. His eyes are on his horns, and when you shout or tickle them, the horns go in and out. Had Providence seen proper to endow the furious unicorn or sober cow with such a gift, the one would never now appear so commonplace on coats of arms. And what a fortune! for our failing farms, if circus managers, with wealth untold, would take the cows for half their weight in gold. Moral. Learn from the snail to take a reproof with patience, and not put out your horns on all occasions. T for tourist. T for the genial tourist who resides in Peckham where he writes Italian guides. Moral. Learn from his information not to cavil at slight mistakes in books on foreign travel. U is for upas tree. U for the upas tree that casts a blight on those that pull their sister's hair unto fight. But oh, the good, they wander undismayed, and, as the subtle artist has portrayed, to spend the golden hours at play beneath its shade. A friend of mine, a botanist, believes that good can even browse upon its leaves. I doubt it. Moral. Dear reader, if you chance to catch a sight of upas trees, betake yourself to flight. V for volunteer. V for the unobtrusive volunteer who fills the armies of the world with fear. Moral. Seek with the volunteer to put aside the empty pomp of military pride. W for water beetle. My little victim, let me trouble you to fix your active mind on W. The water beetle here shall teach a sermon far beyond your reach. He flabbergasts the human race by gliding on the water's face with ease, celerity, and grace. But if he ever stopped to think of how he did it, he would sink. 
Moral. Don't ask questions. X for nothing. No reasonable little child expects a grown-up man to make a rhyme on X. Moral. These verses teach a clever child to find excuse for doing all that he's inclined. Y for youth. Y stands for youth. It would have stood for yak, but that I wrote about him two years back. Youth is the pleasant springtime of our days, as Dante so mellifluously says, who always speaks of youth with proper praise. You have not got to youth, but when you do, you'll find what he and I have said is true. Moral. Youth's excellence should teach the modern wit first to be young, and then to boast of it. Z for Zebu. Z for this Zebu, who, like all Zebus, is held divine by scrupulous Hindus. Von Kettner writes Zebu, Wurst, Zebu. I split the difference and use the two. Moral. Idolatry, as you are well aware, is highly reprehensible. But there, we needn't bother when we get to Z. Our oh, interest in the alphabet is dead. End of a Moral Alphabet by Hilaire Belloc Recording by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia Domingo's Cant A Brazilian Folk Tale by Elsie Spicer Eels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Once upon a time there was a man who was very poor. He was so poor that he had to sell one thing after another to get food, to keep from starving. After a while there was nothing left, except the cat. He was very fond of his cat, and he said, Oh, cat, let come what will, I will never part with you. I would rather starve. The cat replied, Oh, good master Domingo, rest in peace. You will never starve as long as you have me. I'm going out into the world to make a fortune for us both. The cat went into the jungle and dug and dug. Every time he dug, he turned up silver pieces. The cat took a number of these home to his master so that he could purchase food. The rest of the pieces of silver the cat carried to the king. The next day, the cat dug up pieces of gold and carried them to the king. The next day, he carried pieces of diamonds. Where do you get these rich gifts? sending me such wonderful presents asked the king the cat replied it is my master domingo now the king had a beautiful daughter he thought that this man domingo must be the richest man in the whole kingdom he decided that his daughter should marry him at once he made arrangements for the wedding through the cat I haven't any clothes to wear at the wedding, said Domingo when the cat told him that he was to marry the daughter of the king. Never mind about that, just leave it to me, replied the cat. The cat went to the king and said, Oh king, there has been a terrible fire in the tailor shop where they were making the wedding garments of my master Domingo. The tailor and all of his assistants were burned to death, and the entire outfit of my master Domingo was destroyed. Hasn't your majesty something which you could lend him to wear at the wedding? The king sent the richest garments which his wardrobe afforded. Domingo was clothed in state ready for the wedding. I have no palace to which to take my bride, said Domingo to the cat. Never mind, I'll see about it at once, replied the cat. The cat went into the forest to the great castle where the giant dwelt. 
he marched straight up to the big giant and said, Oh, giant, I wish to borrow a castle for my master Domingo. Will you not be so kind as to lend it to me a little while? The giant was very much insulted. No, indeed! I will not lend my castle to you or your master Domingo or anybody else, he shouted in his most terrible voice. Very well, then, replied the cat. He changed the giant to a piece of bacon in the twinkling of an eye and devoured him on the spot. The palace of the giant was a very wonderful palace. There was one room decked with silver, and one room decked with gold, and one room decked with diamonds. A beautiful river flowed by the garden gate. As Domingo and his bride sailed down the river to the garden gate in the royal barge, they saw the cat sitting in the window, singing. After that, they never saw him again. He disappeared in the jungle and went to make some other poor man rich. Perhaps he will come your way some day. Who knows? Quem sabe? They say in Brazil. End of Domingo's Cat